Hi everybody, I'm Rosby. In this video we are going to see how to easily configure from scratch your debugger and decompiler environment for tasks like reverse engineering, binary exploitation, static analysis or whatever you may need. In this video I'll be using a brand new Kali virtual machine I have just downloaded and as you can see it is the latest version as of 2024. Now, as you may already know, when it comes to reverse engineering, we have many tools. There are tools galore you can use in order to make your life easier. For example, Cutter, you have x64 dbg in case you are using Windows. You can use the almighty Ghidra from the NSA, the National Security Agency. You can use IDA, <coughs> free. There is also Yaito, which is the interface for Radar at Shum. Speaking of which, you can of course use if you prefer command line interface based tools, GLI tools like Radar at Shum, GDB and so forth. Now, in case you are wondering which one is the best and which one you should be using, I'm afraid to tell you that I can't answer that. That's something you must discover yourself. It's just a matter of preference. Each tool has its own cons and pros that you should discover and use, of course, the one that makes your life easier and better suits your needs. However, in this video, I'll be showing how easy it is to install and use Cutter which you may already know from my previous videos, and I'll be also answering something that I have been asked many times, and that is how to make a brand new cutter installation look just like what you see in my previous videos. That means the color theme, the opcodes, the comments, and all the fancy stuff you see on the screen. The tabs, of course, everything. That's what I'll be showing in this video, and you'll see it's just a matter of ticking a few boxes in the preference menu. So now, without further ado, let's get into it. First, of course, you have to download Cutter, and in order to do so, you can visit their website, cutter.re.re, or you can, of course, go to the GitHub page and download their pre-built app image that you may find in the release section, which is just right here in the GitHub page. So if you click on releases, you should be able to see their latest release. And depending on the operating system you are using, you must, of course, download the one that works on it. In my case, I'll be downloading the Linux app image. Click on it. It should start downloading. And once it finishes, you may find it in your default download folder. And you can, for example, check the integrity of the file. And if everything's correct, you are good to go. The file we just downloaded is ready to be used, but before beginning, I recommend you placing it in your path environment variable in order to make your life easier and be able to invoke it from anywhere on the system. So in order to do so, let us echo the path variable and we may place the app image file right in this folder, for example. Let's use sudo so we don't get the permission denied. Okay, and now we may just invoke it from everywhere. Now the permission denied you see here on the screen happens because we didn't give execution permissions to the file we are actually trying to execute. In order to fix it, we can use chmod user plus execution permission. And that will be cutter. And now we should be able to invoke it. Okay, so far we already completed the hardest part of this tutorial sort of saying. As you can see, it is pretty simple. Obviously, we gave the file execution permissions, otherwise we wouldn't be able to do so. And yes, you heard right, this was the hard part of the tutorial. Now it's just a matter of changing the preferences according to your needs. So uh, in order to do so, let me close this and I have prepared in the desktop file, folder, sorry, a toy example, which is just a simple main that prints bye bye world. We should be able to compile it using GCC and let me execute it. Okay, it prints bye bye world. Now I have the source code somewhere. Okay, here you can see it's just a simple source code. It uses printf to print a string and nothing else. So I'll be using Cutter to try to reverse engineer this magic binary. Now, since I have Cutter in my environment path, I can just write cut with double T and Kali Linux will autocomplete for me once I press tab. And now let me specify the binary and also an ampersand to the left because I want to launch it in the background. Okay, so now as you can see here, we are about to analyze and debug and also decompile a program called a dot out and that's correct that's the binary i just compiled the source code i just compiled rather said now as you can see this interface we are about to open for the very first time 
While still very useful, it is nevertheless pretty different to what you see in my previous videos, which is this thing right here. So now let us change our current installation to look, if not identical to this one right here, very similar for sure. Now please bear in mind this is an already working instance of Cutter. As you can see, here we have the protections and everything we may need. So you don't have to modify the graphical user interface as I will do. In case you like light colors and uh, just Cutter as it is, you can go ahead and use it like so. And in case you want to customize it, I recommend you taking some time and exploring all the options and preferences Cutter has in order to uh, modify the graphical user interface according to your needs or however you like it. It never hurts fiddling around with all the options. Now, that being said, the first thing I usually do is in the view menu, there is an option that says show tabs at the top. And that what it basically does is moving all the tabs you see here at the bottom and right here at the top, like a browser, for example. Okay, now, as you can see, we have, as always, our functions here at the left by default. So let us take a look at the main function, see how it looks like. This is the disassembly tab by default. If I press spacebar, it should take me to the graph view. In this case, since it's a very simple main, we have nothing around to see. And we can also check the decompiler. Okay, the, the compiler in this case is pretty accurate, as you can see, because the code is very, very simple. In case you are wondering which decompiler is this one, I'm using JSDeck that comes with Cutter by default. But remember that Cutter also comes shipped with Ghidra decompiler by default and you don't even need Java at all. So let us change to Ghidra decompiler and we can see that it is even simpler. Okay, while this view is very useful and usable, of course, we are missing some elements in the interface. For example, in the Windows menu, we can enable the graph overview, which in this case isn't of much use because the graph is pretty simple. We have only one single code block. However, it is very handy when things get a bit more complicated. And usually I also enable the console and the comments, which appear here at the bottom of the screen. Here we have them. Now also a pretty important thing to keep an eye on is the sections of the binary. In this case, you have to enable them in the Windows option, info, and click on sections. And they will appear right here at the bottom of the screen again. Now, since I don't like this position of the sections tab because I don't get to see all the information it has, what I can do is simply click on the title and drag it elsewhere. In order to do so, I just drag it and I leave it right here. Now we can see all the section the binary has and pretty important their permissions. Now if you want to see the virtual maps simply click on the arrow you see right here and it will display them. Since we have created another region or a section set of windows now we can go back to the windows uh, option info and say for example we want to see the segments. As you can see when I move the window around, rearranging the windows in Cutter is just as simple as that. It's a pretty customizable interface. So let's say I want to have my segments information right here close to the sections. And now after rearranging the windows in the working area as you deem necessary, let us finally change the graphical user interface colors. In order to do so, you must go to the edit options and click on preferences. In the preferences window, which I will make a bit bigger, you can see there are many options. In the appearance option, we have the interface theme, which so far is set to native for me. I will modify it to midnight. The good part about changing Cutter's interface colors is that you see changes live on the fly, just as you click on them. So for example, let's say that I want to see how the dark theme looks like instead of the midnight. So I just click on it and it will change almost immediately. So while the dark one is very good, I still prefer midnight theme color. Now another thing you may change is the color theme, not only the interface theme, but also the color theme that applies to the disassembly code you see and how highlighting is done. And let's say that I want to see every single one of them in order to be able to choose the one that I most like. So I just click on basic and now using the down arrow, I can simply 
move throughout all of them. The one that comes pretty fine, rather said the one that's first on the list, which is the Ayu, I find it to be pretty accurate, so I will leave it like that. As you can see, however, there are many options and you can play around with them. You can define your own colors and also your own fonts. You can select your font and even modify the zoom. I will leave it 100%. And now moving on to the disassembly window, you can see we have many options here and we will check some of them. For example, we can modify the syntax that Cutter uses. In this case, we could change Intel to several alternative syntaxes, for example, at and If you are brave enough, you can change it to at and Since that's not my case, I will keep on using Intel. You can see the changes apply just as you click on them. This is at and syntax. And also you can change between uppercase, lowercase and capitalize. I prefer lowercase because that's uh, what I'm used to. But again, this is a matter of preference. One thing I like is displaying the bytes of the instructions. These are the opcodes of its instruction. Then another thing I use is the show an empty line after every basic block. And this, if you click on it, is something that you won't notice in the graph. However, if you watch the disassembly of the program, you will see that whenever there is a basic block, it adds an empty line. I prefer it like so. And I also enable the show preview when hovering this option right here, which basically allows us to preview a function whenever we hover the cursor, the mouse, the mouse pointer over it. In this case, it is just a call to puts that shows us jumping uh, the jump to the PLT. However, it may come handy, it may be useful in certain situations. I usually rather said I always click on the opcode description, which basically places, as you can see, all the comments regarding every instruction. And also I like to show the xrefs, the cross references. That's everything I change from the style tab. And then let us take a look at the graph options. And here what I do is I deselect the option that comes selected by default. Show offset of the first instruction in each graph block. There's one more thing that, and that is how the functions are presented. As you can see here, I have a drop down menu for each function and I don't like it. So what I do is right click on functions and as you can see, it is pre-selected as vertical. Well, I will change it to horizontal and now I don't have that drop down menu for every function. Instead, what I can do is simply move the window to the right and I'm able to see the offset and every other information that I got previously in the drop down menu. And now with all these changes, you can notice that the interface you see on the screen is arranged and looks very similar, if not identical to the one you see in my previous videos. And that's basically every single change I do whenever I have a brand new installation, a brand new instance of Cutter. And now before finishing the video, there is one little detail I want to highlight, a subtle difference, and that is how variables are referenced. I have downloaded the binary from uh, Rob Emporium, red to win which is the binary I used in my exploiting return-oriented programming video. In fact, as you can see, we are right in the very same function, the Puni function. As you may notice, here the variable buff is referenced regarding or with respect to the RBP. It is RBP minus 20 in hexadecimal. However, in the latest cutter version, as you can see, we have stuck minus 28 in hexadecimal. Now, this is something people pointed out earlier. I found somebody asking on the reverse engineering stack exchange, asking about this very same topic. And that is cutter shows addresses relative to the stack, but not RBP. The exact same function, me rbp-20, and he's using probably a latest version of Cutter because he has stack-28, just like we do, just like what I have at the moment. This question has been answered already by another user, and this answer is 100% accurate. And the difference when referencing variables regarding RBP or the stack comes because at certain point of time, specifically during the updates of February 2023, they changed how variables are referenced. The thing is that it doesn't matter because they are just the same. You just have to understand 
what stack means and what RBP or RBP minus eight or plus eight means. I have answered these questions some days ago. And the only thing you have to make sure is that you understand that what is now being called stack is what was previously known as RBP plus eight. That is because now Cutter or Ryzen considers the stack to be right at the beginning of where the saved return address lives. In other words, it is what was previously known as RBP plus eight because we are consuming the whole RBP. Consider that we are in a 64 bit environment. So addresses are eight bytes long and we are pointing here. So that's RBP plus eight. So whenever you see in one of my videos something like RBP minus 20, you simply have to subtract eight bytes from it in order to get the new stack address. That's why, as you can see here, RBP is stack minus eight, RBP minus eight is stack minus 16 or 10 in hexadecimal and so forth. I will link the answer I wrote for this question on reverse engineering stack exchange and make sure you read it. And even more important, you understand it because it doesn't matter how variables are referenced as long as you understand it because they are equivalent. They are just the same. This is the particular release when things changed, when variables change, how they were referenced somewhere around here. You may notice that they stated in the change log that now whatever uh, was referenced regarding the RBP or some register from the stack will now become just stack and any given offset. And that's the video for today. That's how I configure and customize Cutter whenever I have a brand new installation and make it look just like what you see in my previous videos. I hope you liked the video and found it useful. If there's anything you want to say, leave a comment below. And remember, exploit code, not people. See you in the next one. Until then, GG.